Hello, welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja, and today I'll briefly talk about Marx's agonistic view of history. I've often used this term in so many of my conversations with you, but I thought I should have a standalone video that explains my understanding of the agonistic view or agonistic understanding of history. Now, agonism, of course, literally means conflict. So in one way, we could say that Marx's view of history is based in history being conflictual. History being a contest of wills between different classes, right? So in case of Marx, obviously it is the capitalistic class or the workers which eventually become the proletariat. So against that is the idealistic view of history, right? Where people imagine that all human beings has one uni have one universal history that moves from past to the present and we implot human beings in it as one universal entity. And so there is a problem with that because that allows people to posit a universal human self-interest. So based on that assumption that history is this one large movement from the past to the present, a lot of people can then theorize that we as human beings given at any time of history have an internal universal self-interest. We seek our own betterment. We seek our own material betterment. I mean, so much of neoliberal economics is built on these assumptions. But if you have an agonistic view of history that already tells you is that our idea of self and what we consider our self-interest is related to our class. And classes are always in struggle against each other, right? Then the self-interest of a worker comes out to be completely different from self-interest of the one who owns the mode of production. And this becomes pretty clear even in Adam Smith, right? The father of neoliberal economics, right? In his chapter on labor, he clearly tells us that in the conflict between the workers and the capitalists, the workers have a disadvantage. They do not have extra capital to fall back on. Whereas the capitalists have surplus capital and they can withstand any demand from the workers. Adam Smith also teaches us that the capitalists want to extract more labor for less payment, whereas the workers always want less labor for more payment. So that teaches us that inherently on the level of our material existence, if we sell our labor, our self-interest is not the same as that of the capitalists. So if we understand that history is agonistic in which different classes strive to have access to the world's resources, access to capital even, access to happiness in life, we can then understand where we stand, right, in terms of that conflict. Whose, you know, whose side are we on? If we are bourgeois middle class, chances are we have aligned ourselves with the upper echelons of capitalists. So most of the times, even though we are selling our own intellectual or material labor, our sympathies are with the rich people because we assume we'll be there. So that means we are not safeguarding the interests of the place where we are, which is aligned with those who sell their intellectual labor and their manual labor. So there is a vacuum, right? That vacuum cannot be filled unless our bodies and our minds join in solidarity with all those who sell their labor to make a living, right? So in a way, you know, like you will hear on Fox News and elsewhere, class warfare, and this is the vocabulary of class warfare. I mean, because it terrifies them. It terrifies them if people understand that the world is not an even playing ground 
and that there are two large constituencies in the world, those who own the mode of production and those who work for them. That hasn't changed. But if we start thinking in those terms, in terms of class struggle, then maybe we will reach out to people across the aisle from us, right? People who sell their labor, intellectual or material and say, you know, we need to come together to do something about this. We need to come together to extract more of the world's resources for the larger, larger population of the world instead of having six or seven billionaires building rockets and going into space for, what, five minutes, right? Then we'll question the way world works and how it is an unjust world, right? Understanding the world in terms of competing classes and dominant classes fighting to keep the status quo through ideological means, through different kinds of dispensations, is the first step in trying to articulate a politics of change. Right? Think of your life. How is it that we are divided? I work at a university. What keeps us divided? Obviously, I am a tenure track professor. There are lecturers, there are graduate teaching assistants, there are adjuncts. I have internalized this idea somehow that I'm superior because I competed and got this job and they might not be competitive enough. Even though we are from the same class, we all are selling our labors, the hierarchy makes it almost impossible for me to work in concert with the very people who are doing the same thing, selling their intellectual I have been incorporated in the project of power as its function, despite my class interest being in line with those who sell their labor. Right? So that's how, I mean, you know, I could go into more details and more complexity, but the purpose of this video was to, you know, think about what is at stake when we understand Marx's agonistic view of history, history as a history of class conflict and class struggle. Because if we know that, if we even understand it a little bit, then we understand that history is not neutral and that we, just by living in this world and working in it, are part of a certain class whose interests are not necessarily in sync with those who own the mode of production. And if we start thinking like that, maybe my hope is that we'll be able to build lateral solidarities and maybe change the world. So that's it today from the banks of Ohio River. Thank you so much for your time. I will now see you next time. I hope you're taking care of each other. Stay safe, take care of yourself and others. And as always from me, to you. Peace and love.